Welcome to this uh, overview lecture of Chapter 27 in the Instruments Resource Manual Brown Book. Um, the topic is loaned instrumentation, or loaners as they're often called. Loaned instrumentation uh, is not the same as the regular instrumentation that is owned by your hospital. Um, these are specialty sets. They usually arrive just prior to the procedure, hopefully with enough time to process them. 48 hours is a good amount of time for instruments that you routinely process as loaners that you already have the instructions for use for. Um, and then these are typically sent back to the vendor or picked up by the vendor after the case has finished and the uh, cleaning of the instruments has taken place. We're on page 520 of the Brown Book. So why do we have loaners? Because we're talking millions and millions of dollars worth of instruments. So um, the technology evolves rather quickly. So it, it's not feasible for a hospital to invest in over a million dollars worth of instruments um, that they're going to use for a short period of time without knowing when the technology is going to change again. Physicians may also use loan instrumentation as a way of trying different systems or new technologies. So uh, maybe Dr. Jones uses Zimmer instruments for his knees and hips and um, there's another company uh, trying to get him to try their stuff maybe Dr. Jones will like their stuff. So then the Zimmer company will not be bringing their loaners in for Dr. Jones's case, <clears throat> but the other company will. So there are some concerns to address with loaned instrumentation. Planning. Um, surgical technology is always improving and the devices used to perform specific surgical procedures are constantly changing. So this is very true in the fields of orthopedic and neurosurgery. This is where we get most of our loaners from, orthopedic and neurosurgery. So, okay, still on page 520. Um, there are other concerns to be addressed, it says. It says, um, these may include the availability of appropriate processing equipment, delivery of loaned trays in sufficient time to properly process them before the scheduled surgery, tears in the wrappers, manufacturer's instructions for use, the weight of the tray, possibility of wet loads, and more recently the use of extended sterilization cycle times which exceed standard hospital parameters. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> sometimes and I mean, I've been in this field for a long time, and uh, there were often vendors bringing trays in like the night before, at 10 o'clock at night, um, they're bringing in trays for a case that's to go at seven in the morning. That is not enough time. That is ridiculous. This is to be done on top of your regular workload, and they're bringing in eight, three, 12, 16 trays for a case. Um, just eight hours away so uh, that is not enough time but if these are trays that you've been processing according to the instructions for use it's it's possible um, it's it's should not be routine that they're bringing these in at the basically the last minute for scheduled cases but sometimes things happen Maybe the trays were in Texas and they had to be flown by plane and then uh, there was a problem at the airport or whatever. Um, but so things happen. So the paragraph talks about tears and wrappers. So we don't put these trays usually in, in a container like this. They have to be wrapped. And holes and wraps or tears and wraps is the bane of your existence. It's very bad to have holes and wraps. Um, 
the weight of the trays. Sometimes these trays may actually exceed the 25 pound maximum limit. And in, in that case, um, the vendor would have to reconfigure the sets, which were initially validated with a certain configuration by the manufacturer. And we can't just change the configuration and say, yeah, we did a good job, we got it sterile. If we change the configuration, that configuration should be validated. And validations is not something that sterile processing should be doing. We don't do validations. So if there's going to be a change, let's say you have a 30 pound tray, the vendor would have to say, well, these instruments we can take out and we can put them in a separate tray. Um, which actually leads me to another thing. If they bring in eight trays and one has to be split up, then you have nine trays, then this has to be uh, documented on the original documentation where it shows the number of trays that are being brought in for this particular case. Okay. Extended sterilization cycles. So a, a, a standard sterilization cycle is four minutes at 270 degrees pre-vac. Extended cycles exist because sometimes that four minutes is not enough due to the complexity of the trays. So when you walk into your hospital, if they're running um, four minute cycles for just general instruments, general instruments that are owned by the hospital, and then certain trays have to be put on a like a 10 minute cycle, um, that is an extended cycle and it should be based off of the instructions for use. You should not just be running extended cycles based on how you feel about it. You have to go by the IFU. Now, if you don't have an IFU for these sets, that could be a problem. You need to know uh, from the manufacturer how to sterilize this and not just make it up as you go and say, well, it looks like it, we should sterilize it. No, no, no. You can't just go by looking at the tray. You have to have the IFU. Some of the questions that need to be addressed during initial planning sessions include who will order the instruments? Probably going to be the uh, person who schedules the doctor's case. Um, but somebody in your department needs to be responsible for verifying that the instruments are ordered or have arrived. Because there's just nothing quite like last minute realizing that the trays never made it. Um, who needs to know when loaned instrumentation is ordered? What information do these individuals need to know? I'm going to skip over most of these bullet points and skip over to page 521 where it says, if trays are heavy, greater than 25 pounds, a system for proper loading techniques and tray quantities in each sterilizer load must be determined. Note, reducing the number of instruments in the set should not be considered unless the new configuration has been validated by the instrument manufacturer. Sounds like something I've already stated. Okay, I'm going to skip over most of these bullet points and land on page 522. Look at the picture of all the bins. In those bins, those totes, there are instrument sets, there are boxes of sterile implants from the manufacturer. Um, this looks like they're literally just stacked up in a hallway. Unfortunately, this is the way it happens sometimes. So, instrument receipt. Receiving the instruments. See the picture on the bottom, you have the girl in the green scrubs and uh, the delivery person or the vendor wearing a blue shirt, they're going over the trays together. This is actually very important that when these trays are delivered that uh, the contents of the trays be verified and that the instructions for use be given and a list of the tray contents be given to the department. Um, so what she's going to be also doing, not pictured, is opening up the trays and they're going to do a count together. If there's any empty spaces in these trays, these trays are set up so it's like there's a place for everything and it should be everything in its place. And there's usually a little drawing on the bottom of the tray that will show the outline of the instrument that goes there. Um, so let's assume then that everything's going well here. Loaned instrumentation should be received at least two days, 48 hours prior to the surgery date. 
if using familiar sets, and then three days if using new unfamiliar sets. That extra day is for a verification. So the manufacturer validates a process, and then we should be doing a verification, which is uh, something I've never personally been involved in, but you will take the tray and you will read the IFU, and then you will strategically place different chemical and biological indicators inside the trays, sterilize them according to the instructions, open up the trays, take out the chemical indicators, the biological indicators, and make sure that everything is good. Okay, so the things that she's looking for um, and that need to be uh, paid attention to, it says on page 523, the following steps should be followed upon receipt of loaned instruments. Using the inventory count sheet provided by the vendor, verify that each instrument and the quantity listed on the sheet is received. Loaner instruments end up getting lost all the time. And we like to think that we didn't lose it, and sometimes we didn't. Sometimes it literally was not in the set when they brought it in, but nobody found that out. So if we lose their instruments, we're financially responsible as well we should be. But if the instrument was never in there, but we have no evidence of that, then we're still financially responsible. Um, each instrument should be checked for rust, stains, or damage. So they're still going to go through a cleaning process before they get sterilized in our hospital. But at time of receipt, look for problems with those instruments. If there's rust on instruments, we cannot sterilize them. So this is a good time to let the vendor know, hey, I, I can't do anything with this. Once I, uh, I got a loaner set in and there was supposed to be a screwdriver in there and there was and, and it said Stanley on it and it was from Mace Hardware, I guess. Um, so I told the vendor, I said, I cannot sterilize this screwdriver and he said, why not? And I said, because it's not a surgical <laughs> instrument. And he said, but other places sterilize it. And I said, well, this place is not going to sterilize it. We have to actually have an instructions for use that tells us how to clean and sterilize something. So um, I, if you have that from Stanley, surrender it right now. No, he didn't. So check each tray or container for dents or other damage. Um, we're financially responsible. These things are, are in our hands, but it's not just about the finances either. Damaged trains can actually tear wrappers and then can affect the sterilization maintenance process. Okay, look at page 523, those pictures with all the red arrows pointing to everything. Do you see what I see? These are instruments that arrived at the hospital dirty. Many of these loaner instruments have multi, multiple parts that need to come apart for cleaning. And uh, so you will see things like this. When you're taking something apart for cleaning, you will see blood that was left on it at the last facility where they didn't do a good job cleaning. And this happens, this, this does happen. So once the receipt process is completed, all trays should be sent to the decontamination area, even if the trays look clean. If they look clean, you can't see bacteria. You can't see what's actually on those instruments. Um, oh my gosh, I can see what's on that one on page 524. Literally seen this exact thing. <sighs> okay, um, so that targeting guide, um, this is common. People, we need to pay attention when we're in decontamination, whether the set is coming in and it's gonna be used on one of our special precious patients, or whether it's done being used and now it's gonna be shipped out to be used on somebody else's special precious patient. So it doesn't matter if it looks clean on the outside. If there are multiple parts that need to come apart, then this is what has to happen. Uh, it says in the paragraph that even sets that look clean or are wrapped in sterilization wrap may have been inadequately cleaned. So here's a scenario. Um, a vendor brings in some sets 
and he says, I have these eight sets. These four are still sterile from the last place, and they even put them in dust covers. Hooray, hurrah, except for we are responsible for the sterility, thus the, the cleaning of the instruments that we provide to our operating room, which means we unwrap those sterile trays and we go through the cleaning process as if they were just used because, um, well, look at the targeting guide. I mean, this was delivered to a hospital. I don't know if it was wrapped and sterilized or not, but that's irrelevant because this is the kind of thing we need to make sure never happens. Okay, we need to make sure we follow the IFU. How many times do you think IFU is mentioned in this book? Um, we need to make sure that uh, instruments that come apart are taken apart. We need to use the correct cleaning solution according to the manufacturer's instructions. Manually clean each instrument, mechanically clean, clean if it's uh, according to the IFU, maybe probably using the ultrasonic. Ultrasonic cleaning, some loaned instruments require ultrasonic cycles that are longer than the standard cycle set by the ultrasonic manufacturer. So uh, most of the ultrasonics that you'll probably see out there have different cycle choices that you can choose. And then you put them in the washer disinfector. Look at those pretty trays there on that cart ready to go into the washer. That looks like a nice arrangement. Everything's ready to go in. So over on page 525, we have at the top, these are acetabular reamers. Um, they're like half circle or hemispherical cheese graters, basically. They're going to ream cartilage out of, of the hips um, socket joint, right? Um, so they will get filled with that material. Look at the right side picture. It says it's an organizing tray. So in these organizing trays, I see implants, many different implants. I see some drill bits, probably some um, screwdriver bits, and lots of implants. Down at the bottom, this is a Dahl Miles cabling system. This is used to wrap cables around bone fractures that are very, very bad bone fractures um, to, to support the bone uh, in conjunction with other implants. And some of these look like they should come apart and they don't really. So how are you going to know how to clean it? Instructions for use, right? All right, on page 526, I want to point out the note near the top of the page. It says, do not change the trays configured by a manufacturer. These trays are validated for sterilization as built by the manufacturer. Adding or deleted instruments, or deleting, excuse me, instruments changes the tray configuration, which means the tray will no longer be validated. Back to page 525. This Dahl Miles instrument tray would be validated by the manufacturer to be sterilized in a specific manner with specific certain parameters. And if you start adding instruments to that, that will require a new validation. This is the kind of thing I'm talking about. You see the pictures drawn on the bottom of the container. So this is a configuration. Configurations um, should also apply to our instrument sets, the ones that we build. We should actually do a sort of a, a validation of our instrument sets. Um, that's not really the topic. Okay. <clears throat> Packaging. As noted earlier, holes in wrap are uh, a very bad juju. Bad juju. So there's some things that we can do to sort of mitigate the, the potential for holes in wrap. Holes happen in wraps uh, mostly on the corners, the bottom corners. So here are some corner guards that are commercially available. Um, there are other options. There are foam pads that you can put underneath the containers. Most places will say use a towel, a reusable green huck towel, and that's still considered acceptable. Um, 
Most of these loaner instruments probably are not approved for IUSS, okay? But you definitely need to check the manufacturer's IFU to determine whether it can be sterilized by this method. Why would you be IUSSing something? Not because they were slacking and they brought it in at the last minute, but because the case is about to start and they discovered a hole in their app. So if you can't IUSS it, this is going to make the case be postponed. So we really have to look out for holes in the wrap, which means we treat everything very gently. We don't do things like slam things down or drag the trays across surfaces. Very gentle. Um, all right, I don't see a picture of a fully loaded autoclave, but just imagine a fully loaded autoclave. You've got all these trays ranging in, in weight from seven to 23 pounds. Um, there's 15 of them. You can fit them all on a cart, but should you? Um, well, most autoclaves do have a weight limit, which you can find in the, you know, that IFU thing. Um, but it's important that you don't overcrowd a sterilizer because you could end up with sterilization failure or wet loads or superheating. Um, but there's one last point on page 526. How long do you think it takes to dry, or I'm sorry, to cool off after a sterilization cycle a fully loaded autoclave full of metal wrapped in blue wrap? Um, two, three, four hours. How will you know when it's cool enough to touch? When the temperature of it, as read by an infrared thermometer, the gun pointy thingy, um, when the temperature is the same as the room. But other things could cool in as little as 30 minutes. So depending on how much weight and uh, metal density you have on the autoclave. Oh, I love these pictures on page 527. So, it says, trays properly staged for transport. See all that blue sitting on towels? Okay, so you don't have trays that are stacked on top of each other. They're, they're on little individual shelves, on individual little blue tray liners that you, it's really kind of hard to see. Um, decent, that, that's fine. And look at the picture above that, and look at how high some of these instruments uh, or containers are actually stacked. This is a bad scene in appropriately stacked sterile trays. So something like a towel pack or two, we can stack a towel on, pack on top of a towel pack, and that's not really going to be an issue. You're not even coming close to exceeding the weight limit with something like that. But with these trays that could weigh as much as 25 pounds. Think about this. So my wrap is rated for 25 pounds. That is the maximum weight that the, the heavy dutiest wrap should have, 25 pounds. So if I stack a 25 pound tray on top of a 25 pound tray, how much weight is on the bottom of that bottom wrap? 50 pounds. So I've doubled the um, acceptable weight on the bottom of that wrap. And many of these trays have little feet or little ridges, little edges, where it's gonna make, a, it's gonna cause a pressure to, uh, to not be evenly distributed. So you have 50 pounds of weight on these maybe four little feet on, on, the, on the wrap. It's really hard to describe. I am sorry if I'm failing at describing it. Anyways, um, soiled instruments. Now, see those? Those are brooches. It is hard to remove blood from brooches with a gauze sponge. Um, doesn't mean that they can't remove it in the OR, but they'll have to have some kind of special setup like basin set full of sterile water so that they can rinse these things off. So we all know how bad leaving the blood on the instruments can be to the process and to the instruments. Surgeon owned instruments. Let me tell you a story. So there was this one doctor, really nice lady, and I don't know how I never saw her instruments. I think I saw them once and then like two years later, 
I actually saw the inside of her instruments. So these doctor-owned instruments, they will take them out of their trunk of their BMW and they'll bring them into the hospital and they'll ask one of the surgical techs to flash them, right, to make them sterile. Surgical tech probably takes it and rinses it in the hand wash sink. I'm not trying to slander surge techs. And then tosses it in the flash autoclave. Um, so this one doctor, the first time I saw her instruments, actually after probably a couple years of seeing them one time, I, I was in decontamination and these instruments, they were just in such bad shape. So I went and told her, I said, doctor, I just wanted to talk to you about your instruments. And she said, yes, what's going on? Now she was an eye doctor. Do you remember TAS? Think about TAS. She was an eye doctor. And I told her, I said, well, your instruments, they they have they have rust on them. And so I can't technically get these clean anymore. Um, so this was post-surgery and we, we cleaned them, but then after we cleaned them, I took them up to her because she wanted to take them, you know, and take them to the next place, probably back to her office. I said, I, I, can't, I can't sterilize these. It's not possible. And she said, what should I do? And I said, well, um, I recommend you buy new instruments, but there's possi it's possible that you could have an instrument repair person look at them and get them in, uh, in better shape. I didn't believe that part because they were they were pretty bad. Once you got rust, that's cancer for these instruments and they're toast. Okay, so um, surgeon-owned instruments, this is a special problem because they will just bring them in and ask somebody upstairs in the OR to make them sterile. Everything should come through the decontamination room of the sterile processing department and not just be taken directly to the OR, That's that should be a no-no. Don't, don't accept that. We're responsible. We, the hospital, are responsible for the sterility of those items and our department is the department that's really responsible for the sterility of those items and we have to make sure that, uh, to try to keep things from slipping through the cracks like that. All right. So I'm going to end it here and I'm going to upload it to YouTube and I'll see you soon.